thank you very much for the introduction. I um, just want to see if this thing works first. Okay, there we go. So my name's Tony, and I'm, I'm representing a company called Medipost. We're based in South Korea, and we're just establishing our subsidiary company in the U.S. for U.S. and European activities. And I'll tell you a, a short story about our product um, um, that's approved in Korea using um, mesenchymal stem cells from umbilical cord blood for the indication of degenerative osteoarthritis or cartilage defect regeneration in, in, in the knee joint. So we were founded in 2000 um, in Korea, uh, by a clinical pathologist and hematologist. We're still in active management, founder and CEO. Uh, we started off as a cord blood banking company, and we still operate the largest private cord blood bank in Korea. And uh, since 2005, we're a public, uh, publicly listed company traded on COSDAQ in Korea with a market cap of around about $530 million right now, U.S. And this cord blood banking that we have been doing and we are doing um, still, um, over 13 years now, we hold 45% or above uh, private market share in Korea. Korea has one of the highest um, uh, proportion of uh, babies that are storing their cord blood, or the parents with their babies, storing their baby's cord blood unit at about 9% of all the babies that are born uh, are, 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 are storing their blood, cord blood uh, with one of the private companies, including ourselves. So we hold over 180,000 units of cord blood as of last month. And we started off as a um, cord blood banking company. And um, after about a year after establishment, we started doing um, R&D work using mesenchymal stem cells as a source of allogeneic stem cells uh, uh, isolated, uh, extracted from, from the cord blood. Um, and we received um, by the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, formerly known as Korea FDA, they changed the name earlier this year, of biologics license application, which is a BLA that is very similar by um, that, that is um, uh, regulated by CBER and US FDA as a world's first approved allergenic stem cell product. And, and for the record, this was several months before the Prochemals Canada approval, so we'd like to use that word. But this was uh, uh, obviously in Korea that was approved for the, for the Korean market. And we also uh, uh, operate KFDA or MFDS now certified uh, full GMP facility. That This is our own facility in, located in Seoul over uh, approximately 2,000 square meters flow space um, with suites for manufacturing as well as um, our own quality control. And um, that uh, GMP has uh, been operating and manufacturing all the materials for the clinical trials, but also now since the approval last year, we have been releasing over 740 um, uh, commercial products that went on sale um, on, on market, um, which is licensed through a pharmaceutical company in Korea called Donga Pharmaceuticals, which is the largest pharma company. They have the rights for uh, a Korean market. So just a quick background of this is when the baby is born, um, the cord blood unit can be stored as a potential future cord blood transplantation. This is an autologous use for blood stem cell or hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, a conventional cord blood banking model, which you operate as a cash cow business. For those babies or parents who decide not to store their cord blood, then would simply be discarded as a medical waste. We ask them for a voluntary donation of this material for our R&D and manufacturing purpose, and those uh, go on to consent forms and give us those material, then we bring into our GMP, start manufacturing the cells um, using the, that material. And as I said, the mesenchymal stem cells component of that, com uh, or cord blood, umbilical cord blood, are now turned into one of the products which I'll discuss in more detail with as a allogenic product that has been um, approved by KFDA. So just a busy slide, I apologize for this, but it's really just to illustrate the manufacturing components and the costs um, associated with that um, when you com one compares a manufacturing flow from allergenic versus an autologous therapy, these boxes in blue indicate what is um, a process that could be common. For instance, uh, the basic infrastructure cost for a GMP, operating reagents, and, and our packaging and, and, and delivery and on so forth, which are the elements that cannot be, will not be dissimilar between allergenic and autologous models. So, however, if you consider the screening of individual patients, because everything has to be personalized, you've got to screen for, for instance, to release 2,500 doses you actually essentially have to go through the 2,500 elements or material that comes in, as well as you've got to do the release testing in QC for every single component or patient-specific lots, whereas you can batch manufacture and mass-scale manufacture in allergenic model. And in, in the end, this is a published information here, but this estimate goes, it just indicates basically a take-home message is you, you, one needs to 
be able to spend uh, up to uh, twice or up to three times more expense in terms of manufacturing cost simply and it is sort of a basic not sh um, a model between um, allergenic autologous therapy but interestingly still in the um, uh, in the literature or in the space, if you look at number of clinical trials, this is an industry-sponsored cell therapy products that are, are registered with clinicaltrials.gov and various other networks around the world. Uh, as of 2012, you can see almost still about half of them are developing um, autologous um, products versus allergenic product, and this is, again, we're limiting this into industry sponsors only uh, with a non homologous use um, of, of cells. So what this really indicates is, okay, there is still a perception that perhaps the autologous cells are more safe or they can be perceived to public as well as clinicians more easily. Now, the, the hallmark, for those of you who are not familiar with the mesenchymal stem cells, is that they express these typical uh, conventional uh, cell surface markers defined by CD panel of anti antibodies or anti antigens that are um, um, surface, uh, present in the surfaces MSCs detected by these antibodies. And one of the key um, component of this, these MSCs, not necessarily true only for the cold blood MSCs, but those from the bone marrow or other uh, sources such as fat, they, they do not express these um, major histocompatibility complex two types of antigens, the HLA, human leukocyte antigen, DR, DQ receptors, which would, would, would make them masking or not really provoking immune response because they won't be detected by the T cell receptors. So this is one of the key hallmarks we can be safely transplanted into any um, recipients uh, universally without any uh, requirements for HLA matching. Uh, and that, that uh, again, is the hallmark for MSCs, and that's what we, we're basing our, um, our characterization on. And this has been tested um, and um, approved by uh, KFDA, but also uh, by US FDA for IND, which I'll show you the uh, progress on that because we're, we're conducting the trial for the same product under the manufacturing um, um, guidelines by um, US FDA as well. So just a quick flow of manufacturing as you can see, as I mentioned to you, we get the voluntarily donated material here. We do the eligibility test and the infectious disease screening of the blood as it comes in, and the separation of uh, mesenchymal stem cells and subculture into mass, basically a mass expansion of these cells up to certain, certain passage that, that are um, uh, mandated by, by both FDAs. And at this point, they can be harvested and, and basically frozen. And when we receive the prescription order, this is obvious in allergenic stem cell flow here. And as the orders come in, we can then prepare and do the final release preparation for required amounts of the, uh, the cells that, that need to be uh, released depending on the order. And that's the product. For the cardi stem product, which is the knee um, cartilage regeneration product, the, the ambient temperature released product has 48 hours of shelf life upon time of release from GMP. So that can be, uh, must be used within, within two-day window, basically. So this, um, as I said, we went into the market with the full BLA by Korean FDA last year, and it's been on the market for over 13, 14 months uh, since the launch in May last year. Um, the same product, we are c currently conducting clinical trials in, in Chicago and Boston for uh, under US FDA IND, um, again for knee cartilage regeneration for phase 1 slash 2A trial, and this is under, uh, uh, underway right now as we speak. So a, a very quick um, MOA slide here, um, as some of you may be very well familiar with, the mesenchymal stem cells in the literature now, um, the para so-called parakine action, uh, the action by these um, MSCs, when they're exposed to an injury factor or injured area, injured area, they respond to the chemokines and cytokines that are present in the, uh, in the area, and then as a response to those factors, release the paracrine um, 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 uh, proteins or profiles of proteins. And through our uh, animal experiments and R&D work, that we've shown that the major mechanism of action for these cells is through this uh, release of proteins rather than a direct differentiation and engraftment into the host tissue um, uh, of becoming a cell fate or choosing to be a cell fate here, uh, depending on the location. So, so the, the majority of the cells do this action and then remain in the, um, in the location where they're implanted for a brief period of time, up to eight to 10 weeks. And, and then they disappear or they die after releasing these proteins. Now, these proteins that are secreted by these cells as a response then have a downstream effect such as um, anti-inflammatory and anti-apoptotic or pro-mitogenic, really controlling the environment and, and kick-starting and stimulating the, the host on endogenous cells to, to um, do the regeneration um, of um, onto tissue. And by understanding and being able to test and measure these factors that are relevant for certain um, indications, then we can 
the, the concept known as potency marker system that we can actually control for batch to batch variation from different donors coming in for one product and also for different products because we also make um, different products for different indications um, using the same source of raw material which will be the cord blood and the chemical stem cells. I will um, show you some of that example just very briefly towards the end. So um, as I said, this was approved by South Korean FDA January last year and we went on um, to the market last year and, and recently this was report this month published by HSBC, some disruptive technologies and some, some are really um, uh, technologies that are changing the landscape of uh, bio and, and medicine is that stem cell, under stem cells they pointed out um, our allogenic um, cord blood drives MSCs here product and, and at the same time around the earlier last year KFDA also approved two more, two other autologous um, based cell therapy products by other companies in Korea. So I just want to talk to you about the, the actual product here. Um, the CARDI stem, which is the allogenic product that I'm describing, uh, treats the um, cartilage defects, including uh, osteoarthritis. Now, this diagram and the um, arthroscopic images show the four grading six scale that are in practice of orthopedics um, defined by International Cartilage Repair Society. Grade one being a very superficial and minor um, um, defect on the cartilage, whereas grade two and three get more severe forms. Grade two based Basically, less than 50% of cartilage from the surface has been damaged. More than 50% of surface of um, uh, depth of the cartilage has been gone. And then here, you've got the complete loss of cartilage from spaces where you can actually see the whole uh, the bare bone exposed, and that's the worst grade you can have in this um, a, a cartilage defect um, scaling system. And we have um, uh, treatment options that are available in, in, the, in the market. Uh, this is around the world where there's a procedure known as microfracture, which is simply drills holes which are applied to uh, patients with grade four, four, uh, three or four cartilage defects, which is simply drilling through the holes um, or the area of the cartilage defect through the bone, compact bone, and, and let the bone marrow bleed out from underneath. And, and that's all you do. And then what that does is that releases the bone marrow stem cells that gets out to the surface or the bone area or the cartilage missing area, and then it turns into cartilage um, regeneration effect. Um, and the other alternative here is knee replacements, uh, as you know, um, artificial knee joints for total or, total or partial knee replacement therapy. So these are the implants of synthetic material that actually gets covered under the top or the defect area here. So you can put the foreign material such as um, uh, metal caps basically to, to uh, create an artificial joint. Um, and then in between there is an uh, uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation products such as um, uh, products from companies like Genzyme and Tygenix that uses patients own tissue, an aut autologous therapy model where um, a, a, a cartilage um, uh, from a patient's own a knee joint is uh, taken out and then the, the chondrocytes are uh, um, expanded in uh, ex vivo and are brought into the same patient. And now we, these, the, there are, these are the, some of the um, uh, major um, intervention options that are available uh, with a great limitation on some of these um, um, interventions such as microfracture is only known to be effective if the patient has a small size defect and also the, when the patient is below the age of roughly 50 to 55 years of age. So what that means, if you're, if you're in the age of 55 or beyond, uh, then you, your orthopedic surgeon is not likely to recommend you for microfracture treatment because the idea behind that is your own stem cells released from bone marrow is not as good or not, not as functioning as when you are a younger age than when you're older age. The other um, limitation on the other potential option, which is total knee or partial knee replacement, is that artificial knee joints tend to only last 10 to 12 years once they're implanted. So the ten, there would be um, uh, 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 intended delay for these patients. So in other words, if they get these artificial knee joint surgery done when they're too young, for instance, 55 and 60, by the time they get to the age of 70, 75, they still have you know, 10, 20 years to live, but this artificial knee joint, are usually their, their lifespan does not hold that long. So there was a clear gap as far as we could see here um, between these two sort of age group and this, these were the patient um, pool that we've enrolled in our phase three trial. So the yellow bars represent the number of subjects that are enrolled, 103 patient trial control randomized. Um, and these were subjects that are in these age groups. We can see the majority of them are between the ages 50 and 70 and we deliberately enrolled those patients because we wanted to test by using the CARDI stem, which is an allogenic mesenchymal stem cell derived from umbilical cord blood, whether they, they can, their cells can actually uh, lead to regeneration of 
cartilage, um, even in this um, age group of patients who are actually in this gap here. And, and the oldest objects enrolled were at ICLS grade four, remember the four, the four, four being the worst grade. Uh, and obviously if this works, then we have um, cardiac stem that can not only be effective for the patients between this age group gap, but also covering the wider uh, range of um, um, patient age as well. So here's a distribution of the defect size of those individual subjects on 103 subjects are enrolled. So uh, remember I, I mentioned to you the microfracture. Another um, downfall of that is that microfracture tends to only work with a smaller size defect um, up to or less than three to four square centimeters um, um, in size. Um, not on, so so we, we made sure that we had some uh, bigger lesions, so to speak, or cartilage defects uh, uh, were included in the subjects that we t uh, test for a phase three trial. So primary endpoint uh, for this particular trial with uh, KFDA mandate uh, our design was that we looked at one year time point or 48 weeks time point post the single treatment using cardistem or as a control microfracture. And the improvement at this point was uh, defined as a one grade or better improvement in cardiac generation. So because all the patients or subjects were um, at grade four, meaning they had some size or varying sizes of cartilage defect defect that is showing bare bone. So if a, a patient has improved, um, then the uh, level of cartilage would be re uh, regrown or regenerated. As you can see, 97% versus 70% of the microfracture versus cardiac stem group had shown improvement, meaning it led to a regeneration of cartilage. But if we split that same data into different age groups here, as you can see, that below the age of 50, both the cardiac stem microfracture show 100% improvement, uh, which is consistent with the literature. But as you go into the older age group, you can see in the microfracture group of 50, 60, and 65 and beyond, you'll see a percentage of pa patients that are not responding or becoming infected with uh, a microfracture treatment, again, which is consistent with the uh, literature. The other a very, very important uh, component of these regrown cartilage, even in the young patients with microfracture treatment, uh, as, already, uh, as I already told you, the, another downfall is that the microfracture treatment tends to lead to a regeneration of cartilage known as fibrous cartilage, which is not a true type of cartilage you, you, you would normally have in this kind of uh, high line uh, in the joint, which being the high line cartilage. So when we did the biopsy of these patients at primary endpoint, both the control treatment group of uh, patients and then the cardiac stem treated group of patients that you can see in a microfracture, again consistent with literature, that this was leading to a fibrous cartilage regeneration, which is not a true type of cartilage that actually um, function as a normal cartilage. Here, um, in contrast, in a cardiac stem treated group of patients, even in the old age group, you can see this um, staining, histological staining showing a cartilage regeneration that is in a high line type of cartilage. It's showing that it's a natural form of cartilage. So we've just finished the phase year three follow of these patients and, and the elements that we're looking at was a pain score and these are the functional scoring systems to see whether that uh, initial um, efficacy was maintained at year three and this is um, some of the preliminaries with full analysis we're still waiting on but you can see this is a WOMAX scale showing the lower the score the better functionality the patients will experience and as you can see a cardiac stem microfracture start off here and then they improve both groups um, at one year time point but now only at a three year time point now you can see the microfracture group patients going, getting to the worst or the back to the baseline, and a cardiac stem treated group of patients are maintaining that improved state. And also um, another functional scoring system, in this case, the higher the score, the better. You can see a one-year improvement time point, not much different between the two groups, but we are now able to see in year three time point that the microfracture falls off, and then whereas the cardiac stem patients actually uh, maintain that efficacy. So this is... Um, Currently available in, in Korea, uh, we do it by open surgery, arthroscopic surgery, implantation. And as I said, the three-year follow-up is now complete. Uh, on market, we've treated 673 patients as of this month. And it's, of course, now available uh, in Korea. I'm just going to skip this uh, post-study, case study, and we're um, talking to these um, uh, markets right now, and all, my, my job is to now um, uh, uh, follow through the clinical development programs in North America, South America, and European continents with this product. And um, just uh, one quick um, comment about the other two products we didn't get to time to talk about. It's my last slide. We also have an indication for a pediatric lung, a prematurely born infant's lung indication called bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It's an orphan indication where in the middle of phase two trial in Korea and uh, in the process of getting an IND for US market, 
and we expect that to clear after phase two because it's an awful indication and that will happen first in Korea. The other program that we're doing in Korea also phase, phase one and about to begin phase two is Alzheimer's disease patient with the mid, mid, mid to late stage Alzheimer's disease patient which is showing a very good efficacious as well as safety data from phase one. We look, look forward to actually bringing um, that to the US market as well. Thank you. Thank you.